Welcome to this very special edition of A Shot in the Arm podcast, released today on all your favorite podcast platforms around the world and YouTube, and in person as a satellite symposium at AIDS 2022 in Montreal, Canada. I'm Ben Plumley, and I'm delighted to bring you this in partnership with the global health and medical team of Chevron. Today's session is about how the private sector's long heritage of collaboration with communities, NGOs, and governments that has been forged over the last 30 years of the AIDS epidemic, how that has been brought to bear against COVID-19. What are the lessons learned? And in this example, what are those lessons that Chevron and its health and medical department have learned and its partners in the NGO and community sectors? And what does the future of trying to bring AIDS to an end in a new era of pandemic's preparedness and response look like for all of these partners? Well, that's what Chevron's chief medical officer and a friend of a shot in the arm podcast, Dr. Huma Abassi, and I hope to distill over the course of the next 50 minutes or so. Huma, welcome back to a shot in the arm podcast. My gosh, what a couple of years we've had. What have been the biggest changes for you? Hey, Ben. Good to be back. Well, I think, you know, um, we talked a bit in the last couple of years. And from if I remember the pandemic from late 2019, when this was a small outbreak in Asia to uh, 2022, early when it became a huge uh, pandemic, we all went through unprecedented times. And it was a huge challenge for us to come up with a good, successful COVID response. But what helped us at the time also was our great partnerships, internal and external. And what we did, we brought together these um, uh, smaller departments like human resources, safety, emergency management, our supply chain to keep our workers healthy and safe through a very cross-disciplinary response. The biggest change for us now, I think going back, we already realized that we may be losing ground on some of the things that we um, had uh, focused on in the past, some of the infectious disease or non uh, communicable diseases. And now the biggest thing has been to bring those back at the same time while we provide that COVID response to some of the countries where they need it. So I think, you know, going forward, that's b- getting back to the base business, w- what it means for health and medical, making sure that the countries have adequate COVID response and putting a focus on health and well being of our workers and the communities. Yeah, and we'll undoubtedly come back to uh, building up and trying to reclaim lost ground. I'm sure that's going to be a theme for for indeed the entire AIDS 22 conference, 2022 conference. Well, shall I go ahead and introduce the rest of our panel? We have people calling in from all over. Firstly, Dr. Chinwe Okala, lead physician for Chevron Nigeria. Chinwe, the last time you and I saw each other was in Oakland for the launching of a new mobile clinic for the city's marginally housed. You then went back home to Nigeria, and how have these last two years been for you and the family? Okay, thanks, Ben. It's um, great being here. And, um, well, I'll say it's been a bit of a roller coaster for us as a family, and I suspect that's what has happened to many other families I think it's not really knowing what to expect. We've had to learn to live and respond in a very uncertain world. But it's given us an opportunity to be grateful for the little things I think we took for granted, like um, meeting up with our family and friends. All in all, I'll say it's been a period of growth and that's, and that's something good. Well, it's great to have you on the podcast, and fingers crossed the technology is going to serve us throughout this. Um, <laughs> and now, our uh, and now our our guests outside of Chevron. I'm really honoured that we are joined by um, Ambassador Eric Gooseby, um, the UN Special Envoy on TB, uh, Professor at UCSF, uh, former Global Coordinator of PEPFAR. And actually, Eric, you were part of the original Pangea team that assisted uh, Chevron in establishing its um, HIV, TB and malaria uh, uh, programs. But it's really great to see you. Again, you and I have not seen each other in person, although we have over the joy of technology. Um, How's it been for you these last two years? Well, Ben, it's great to see you. And Huma, it's great to see you and everybody. Um, I think all of us have been um, humbled by the uh, COVID two-year 
kind of shelter in place on and off response that we've had. Uh, I've continued to have clinical responsibilities that have put me in the hospital regularly, but other than that have been um, doing everything from either the office or from uh, my home office, which has been a real lifestyle change. All the travel stopped, uh, all of my uh, belief that I needed to see something to understand where it was going. Um, and it required that we really be creative in understanding and creating outcomes that we all felt comfortable with in managing these programs from afar with, you know, over two years of um, kind of no visits. But uh, I think uh, I've been um, really um, st struggling with looking at the different national responses to the COVID threat uh, and seeing wide variation in efficacy uh, and impact because of a decentralized or non-decentralized healthcare delivery system. So it's been a mouthful, to say the least. <laughs> a mouthful. And when you said you've been... Um... Uh, you've been in hospital. You were, of course, treating patients, not in hospital yourself, I hope, touch no, wood. yeah, treating. We're also joined by Chris Collins, who is the CEO of Friends of the Global Fight. Again, a friend of a Shot in the Arm podcast. Chris, you've been incredibly busy over the last couple of years, and especially so now. Uh, working to help the Global Fund secure the $18 billion that we need for its next replenishment. How is all of that going? Hi, Ben. It's great to be here. Um, well, we're off to a great start in that, you know, the Biden administration um, in their budget request uh, requested $2 billion for the Global Fund in FY23. That would be a 28% increase, so very uh, big increase. And they also noted their intention, intention to pledge $6 billion for the three-year replenishment. That would be the highest pledge by the U.S. in history. Um, and we're very thankful to the Biden administration also for hosting Global Fund Replenishment in September. Um, now we need to hear from the other donors. I mean, as you know, uh, the U.S. by law can't provide more than a third of total global fund resources. So that means we really need to see the match from other donors or we're going to leave U.S. money on the table. So we're working with advocates and private sector uh, companies, in, including Chevron, globally to try to support, um, uh, you know, to bolster support in other donor countries uh, for them to make uh, really big pledges. So we're hopeful um, and I think we'll be seeing those pledges roll out uh, over the coming months. Well, we're recording this uh, middle end of June. So when this goes live at AIDS 2022, hopefully the Europeans will have uh, stepped up, including my, uh, my home country. And maybe that's a conversation for another time, Chris. Now, we're also joined by Sally Ethelson, who is with PATH. And PATH is an incredible organization. I think many of us know the wide range of work that it does in product development, in advocacy, in country support and implementation. And in preparing for this podcast, Sally and I were looking at each other, I think from our offices, as our dogs were barking um, away in the background. And we know that we've met each other in the past and we can't work out where. Um, I don't suppose we'll sort that in this podcast either, Sally, but, but how are you? How are things going? And, and how has it been for PATH these last two years? Well, I think as Chinwei said, it's it's been a roller, bit of a roller coaster, and I would note that thankfully the uh, the pups are actually out for a walk, so hopefully we'll stay quiet. Really appreciate the opportunity to be with everyone here, and of course, I think that um, we at Path have been dealing both with the challenge of managing this pandemic for our own staff, and I very much appreciate how PATH has actually responded in terms of its prioritizing staff. But then as uh, Ambassador Gooseby said, it's this question of how you actually do all of this work without getting on an airplane. How do you do remote supervision of healthcare workers? How do you do all of this work? I think we've learned a tremendous amount and I hope that we will have an opportunity to carry some of these learnings with us into the future. 
And again, I hope we're going to cover some of that in, in uh, this session today. Absolutely. And so last, and by absolutely no means least, it's Lance Tomer, Chief Executive Officer of the San Francisco Community Health Center. And I need to declare an interest uh, because I am the chair of the, the center. So Lance and I have worked very, very closely over the course of the last two years. We've just come out of a fantastic gala event in person in San Francisco with the incredible 90s singer Jodie Watley performing for us. I had to get Jodie Watley in. Um, and <clears throat> But in... in in practice, it's been a really, really tough time for the centre, providing continued HIV care, but also COVID care to uh, to its to to its client base and its patients um, in and around the Tenderloin of San Francisco. So, Lance, how are you doing? How have you survived the last two years? Hi, Ben. Thank you so much. It's such an honour to be part of this panel. Um, and an exhausting, uh, thoroughly exhausting uh, past two years. Um, and, and as you mentioned, you know, I mean, we've been here in San Francisco in the Tenderloin on the ground, uh, never, never missed a beat uh, since, since we started. Um, and then, you know, and then to actually um, uh, come to this place where we could celebrate at a gala in person, you know, and in community. That was such a beautiful experience where we could actually be together and finally uh, celebrate, actually, you know, kind of uh, all the good work that we had been doing and um, and just being connected to community. community. We'd missed that for so long. And, and then the um, amazing Jody Wadley was just fabulous. Yeah, it wouldn't be a shot in the arm podcast if we didn't bring in a pop singer at some point or another. So look, let's get into the first part of the, our discussion, which is really how we've all partnered together to implement effective responses, both for our own workers, our own people, but for our clients and our, our communities, how we've shared our experiences and lessons learned, given that this has been a very, very fast-moving field with a lot changing. Um, <clears throat> and Lance, if it's okay, I'd like to start with you. Uh, you know, San Francisco has been much in the headlines globally about um, the issues facing homeless people in San Francisco's Tenderloin, the approach that the city is having to take in balancing care and support with perhaps more um, legal means. And, you know, the center provides services to the homeless, to the LGBT community, especially uh, trans communities, and of course, injection drug users. So, so how did COVID firstly impact the center? And then secondly, how did you work with people like Humer and her colleagues at Chevron to help mount an effective response? Oh, big questions. Uh, you know, I, I, you, you're taking me back, I know, uh, to two years ago. And, and what I will say is uh, March 17th, 2020 is seared in my memory. That day, that shelter in place here, uh, the order in San Francisco took hold. And I just remember that moment because we didn't know what to do. There was no roadmap. And, but, but we did uh, look at all of the guidance that San Francisco was putting together. And, and they said essential workers needed to be in place. They, they actually couldn't shelter in place. And what we declared was that our team were, in fact, all of us essential workers. When we look at the work that we were doing around the homeless community with the trans community here in the Tenderloin neighborhood of San Francisco, impacted, like you said, by homelessness and substance use and mental illness, these crises that are affecting our city, what we knew was that we couldn't stay home. We actually needed to come into the office and our health center and actually all of us go into the streets and alleyways and campments of the Tenderloin because what we, what we knew from HIV was that if we didn't do that, our most marginalized communities would be the last to get information and data and resources and then testing and vaccination, everything that came down. Uh, we, we would, again, be the last to get these, the, these resources. And, and we were pretty adamant that that was not going to be the case this time. And so it was pretty, um, it was pretty inspiring in terms of the, 
the the work that that the team at, at San Francisco Community Health Center did, and and I and I love that work. And and the second part of that question is is you know how we connected with with Chevron and others. And I will say that um, Huma, your team you were amazing. Like they never stopped being in touch. Mike and Janice connected with us actually more so than almost anyone. I was I was on calls with them. They were asking well, how are things going? What PPE did we need? Because Whenever you got you got more, they they would share that with us, and it was just it was just so um, it, it felt like we weren't alone. You know, we were when we're in the streets without a roadmap, we we were kind of uh, following, you know, trying to figure out the course of action, and then to have folks uh, reach out to us and and provide those resources, and and it was a lifeline. So I just want to say thank you that the, that kind of partnership was uh was incredible and 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 really really helped us through the past two years yeah i we were uh, and again janice mike um whom are from your team we were saying okay who's got this ppe who's got that okay how can we get this to to people i i you know, before coming on to the conversation, I think it is it is sort of really important that that we really recognize how part of the community you have been for us. Thank you. So, Eric, may I go to the 38,000 foot level? And um, I suppose it would be right to say that the US has gone through a few iterations in its response to the pandemic over the course of the last couple of years. We originally expected the U.S. to have one of the best public health systems in the world, if not the best. But it undoubtedly had some challenges when it came to implementation. And I'd love to be able to get your thoughts on that. But then also how you feel that the work that um, employers and corporations like Chevron, and we see it in the example with San Francisco, with the Community Health Center, how private sector organizations had to step in and provide uh, sort of more concrete, immediate support to workers and their families? Well, th thank you, Ben. Um, it was a remarkable uh, reality check. Uh, in So I participated in the policy discussion in the San Francisco Department of Health uh, with senior po the senior management team twice a week for the entire two-year period. We just stopped about a month ago. Um, meeting. And it uh, was a, a discussion of essentially all of the policy issues that came through, uh, filtering of recommendations from CDC to international, multilateral, uh, and trying to make sense. So the director of health, um, uh, Grant, was put in a position where he could speak uh, uh, carefully to the mayor of the city to allow her to understand the threat and make a response. Uh, San Francisco was remarkably effective at allowing the science and the data to dictate the recommendations. But um, the state conversation and the national conversation, which I participated in um, uh, as well, uh, was never able to introduce an orchestrating role where a top-down definition of threat and response uh, were coordinated. Um, as a result, uh, we kept engaging and re-engaging in defining and redefining the threat uh, and in going through uh, a similar scenario of business community rising up and arguing that uh, shutdown was um, uh, unacceptable and putting an extraordinary amount of pressure on the mayor uh, and at the state level, the governor to not uh, shut down. So I have never been in a situation that was quite so fluid for so long. And I really have to attribute that to the decentralized healthcare delivery system that we've created, as you say, Ben, uh, in the United States, which has strengths, but for responding to a common threat uh, is a weak tool. Uh, furthermore, the the segregation of individuals and in 87% of the people in San Francisco hold an insurance for health that uh, should have a role in pandemic uh, response, but 
none of them, none of the third party payers or managed care systems felt it was their responsibility to respond to a public health threat, felt the departments at city and state levels were the responsible entity and really took a hands off approach for about three months. Uh, it took a discussion with legal, uh, uh, with lawyers to realize that they did have a liability uh, that uh, they needed to honor. And then they came to the table with some help with education, PPE, uh, and testing, but never fully uh, took over uh, in that regard. So what it told me was uh, our system is broken uh, in a way that we hadn't appreciated, uh, a pandemic threat, a common threat uh, to have multiple resource pots to respond for different populations in small geographies created a need for a discussion that overwhelmed uh, the ability to convene because there was no identified convener. Uh, the lack of federal orchestration uh, left that open to states. States have never played that role, put it on counties. Counties have never played that role. So we had 57 different counties asking for the same PPE and uh, crunched all of the procurement distribution systems that you can think of and that we all live through. And I would say we still have not fixed. So I'm, um, I'm not uh, optimistic. It didn't present a pretty picture. It didn't present, present a shared responsibility attitude in the national response. And I think we also saw that reflected in the global response to the same threat. Uh, individuals, I think, very um, in, in almost every sector uh, did not um, understand uh, how to convene a multiplicity of divergent resources to come together to fund uh, in a linear way a, a response. And uh, I think that the demand on the private sector as a result of that confusion was higher than normal in uh, both domestic uh, and international settings. Uh, the idea that everyone had an element of the response that needed to be mounted, the so-called shared responsibility, uh, was um, often picked up by multinational uh, corporations better than multilateral corporations. So I do think that there are examples of that that I'm very aware of. But I also have to come back, and I'll, I'll end with this, to the, re to the fact that um, those who are responsible for the population's health care need to be continuously put in front of the expectation that they respond. They hold the authority to do it, but they frequently abdicate that authority and it diffuses across those who come to the table to uh, be supportive and often are given the baton to carry when a more appropriate role would be a peripheral enabling orchestration around a core response that is orchestrated by you know, governments generally, but by coalitions where governments aren't strong enough. So qu quite a moment. Quite a moment. That's, Eric, that's possibly understatement of uh, the 21st century. We may have quite a few in this century, who knows? But you're absolutely right. And, and Huma, can I turn to you and then look at it from a corporation perspective? Now, here we are, releasing this podcast at AIDS 2022. Chevron has been a longtime partner at these conferences. And I know I've been regularly asked, well, what are they doing here? Why are they here? What's their interest? And I think many people are still very surprised that you have been so involved for so long. So I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, but particularly in answering that, how the legacy of your involvement in the HIV fight helped inform the kind of rapid response COVID um, workplace programmatic um, activities that Eric was referring to? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Actually, that's a very good question. And every time we go to a international AIDS conference, I am asked that question. So 
Chevron and Energy Company and why you're here. But I also want to uh, thank Lance and uh, Dr. Bruce for highlighting the importance of uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, we, uh, I know it's a huge gap, uh, and we we feel that you know we can't fill the gap completely, but we can do whatever we can in our own best way to support the organizations that are there. Uh, looking at the health needs of the community. Um, and just going there, you know, I will get to the uh, Chevron's history, but I, I'm actually very proud to say that we have a rich history of supporting our community partners and neighbors. And just going back to the last uh, couple of years for COVID, we spent over 29 millions in um, just uh, on humanitarian efforts. And that was just realizing mm-hmm. that there was a need. Our hospitals, our clinics in the area where we operate needed PPE, the basic stuff. We were shipping supplies to Angola. We were looking at what uh, was needed in our San Francisco Bay area because the company, multinational companies like Chevron believe that this business success is inextricably uh, connected to the health and prosperity of our communities. And we cannot do this without our partners. But at the same time, we want to help our partners to uh, stabilize and be there. And then, you know, we have 140 years plus um, experience in operations where we have felt that we need to understand the health needs of our community to reduce risk, to build capacity and enable prosperity. It actually uh, makes me a little emotional to even go back and think about our journey in HIV AIDS, our response to HIV and AIDS basically began in mid 1980s when we realized that uh, we saw our workforce and the community right at the heart of the San Francisco Bay Area devastated by this disease. And and similar things were happening in Africa, in some of the parts of Africa. And I'm sure Dr. Chinwe will talk about that too, where we saw women were being disproportionately uh, impacted. There was stigma. And that stigma, unfortunately, that we even see today with COVID and with the monkeypox right now. So we felt that we had to step up, fight this stigma and provide communication, provide comprehensive medical care to people and the marginalized communities where it was needed. So, I mean, we began this journey with just educational material, but at the same time, in 2005, we realized we needed a policy and we were one of the first first few private uh, companies and the leading one in the industry to come up with an HIV AIDS policy that provided comprehensive, um, you know, anonymous testing, fighting stigma, medical care and treatment for our workforce and also for our communities. And we realized that we cannot just be within the fence. We had to go outside of the fence and think about the communities and partners. And I'll just give a few examples. You know, partnership is actually, um, and that's why we are here, we're talking about it, has been a key. In fact, if I may say that partnership uh, is a, it's our uh, Chevron way and a value, and it's woven into the fabric of our company's culture. And we believe that through our partnerships, we can learn more about our communities and have an effective and efficient response. We have several examples, um, you know, of supporting our par- partners over the years. For instance, um, I'll mention a few like for Global Fund. We have a 12 year history of partnership as one of the largest private um, sector donors at the time. And now we are supporting Global Fund through the Friends of the Global Fight and whose advocacy efforts have been great in bringing that uh, information and replenishing the fund. So we uh, we continue our response and we don't lose ground on that. Then we have partners like Lance here, who is working in San Francisco Bay Area to the clients that uh, providing holistic services. I am so glad that these services were expanded to involve mental health and well-being. Uh, because that was something that we, we realized was a need. So, you know, we have been, we we have worked with academia, Dr. Gooseby here with UCSF, and we brought Dr. Gooseby to one of our workforce um, uh, webinars, and he was there talking about COVID. So we have expanded um, our, um, just our offerings, bringing in partners and making sure that we are working together in a collaborative fashion 
to provide an effective response. And Chevron has leadership in workplace health has also been recognized, if I may say that, um, you know, by several accolades and awards that we've received on global um, healthy workplace awards and several others. And, uh, you know, I don't think we have time there to mention, but I would, um, you know, wrap this up by saying that partnership has been a key in our journey in HIV AIDS. Thanks, Huma. And <clears throat> perhaps, Chinwe, I could turn to you and you could give us a little sense of how that has played out uh, in Nigeria, both, as uh, uh, Huma said, inside the workplace and in the community. Okay, so um, in Nigeria, I think when the pandemic started, we, were, um, we thought we were reasonably well positioned to respond to the pandemic because of our previous efforts working on HIV, malaria, TB, and even working on Ebola and Lassa fever, and when we had monkeypox um, in Nigeria. But we had a number of best practices, experience, and partnerships, which we thought we could lean into, and certainly we did lean into them. But I think, having said that, nothing really prepared us for the challenges of dealing with a novel virus that nobody really knew anything about at the time. So internally, our medical team um, and our established... We have a slight pause here, and we will try and come back to Chinwe in a moment. Um, this is the joy of recording something around the world. But clearly, the experience of Chevron in Nigeria has been absolutely key. But while we wait for Chinwe to return, Chris, could I turn to you? You established a private sector advisory council to uh, assist uh, your efforts in promoting sustained support for the Global Fund. And, and I guess the big question is, during this two-year period, do you have examples in mind of where um, you know, countries, community partners were able to turn on a dime and respond effectively to the, the challenges of the three diseases plus, um, plus COVID. Um, and then, you know, your sense of how you were able to communicate that to advocacy partners like Chevron. Sure, sure. Well, the first, I would say on the private sector advisory council, um, Chevron is a co-chair of that council and we're very appreciative of their leadership there. Um, they've been co-chairs for several years now. Um, and the council's just been an incredible uh, advocacy tool for us in Washington. You know, we realized about five years ago that we just hadn't done enough to tap the uh, perspectives of the private sector in terms of um, talking to U.S. Uh, decision makers about support for global health and why that's important and why U.S. investment in global health is valuable to the private sector and um, the importance of the partnerships there between public and private. So the Private Sector Advisory Council has been enormously impactful over several years, writing letters to the executive branch, to Congress in support of U.S. investment in global health and the Global Fund, um, sharing intelligence uh, uh, with each other. Uh, Chevron actually hosted a meeting of the group at the International AIDS Conference in Mexico several years ago, and I know we'll be working together um, in Montreal as well. So that's that's the, that private sector uh, advisory Council has been a great model for us and, and really done a lot. Um, you know, yeah, in COVID, we did see for all the tremendous challenges that we saw, it was incredible how communities and organizations were able to rally and pivot to this new disease threat. Um, just one example to your question, in Djibouti, the Global Fund is partnering with UNDP and UNAIDS on a uh, program of mobile health vans, um, which take health directly into communities. And many of the folks that are working on these vans are women. And so this really helps women in communities um, in the country um, access services uh, without having to get to the clinic, but also in a, in a more non-stigmatizing way. You know, we've, as you know, we've seen in HIV, but we've also seen in COVID, um, a lot of stigma and stigma in uh, uh, preventing people from accessing services, stigma making people more at risk. So these mobile vans were one way to, to try to get around that stigma and bring health directly to people. More broadly, I'd say there's a lot to learn about what happened right and wrong 
in the COVID response. But certainly one thing that I think is really underappreciated is how the HIV platform, and I would also say for malaria and TB as well, but how those platforms mobilized very quickly to respond to a new disease threat. Uh, if you think about uh, the contribution of HIV-funded laboratories or the whole research community uh, in Africa, uh, supply chain, uh, surveillance, um, basic health services providing um, on HIV, these were harnessed to respond to COVID. And in many cases, it was the community systems, community programs funded through HIV that were able to get trusted information into communities about COVID um, and reach the most marginalized, one of the things that we really depend on community actors to do. So I think for sure a takeaway from us is, is to see that, yeah, we've been funding these disease-specific programs, but they have been um, at the same time investing in stronger health systems, investing in community systems, and those systems were there when a new disease threat came along. This is important, right? Because one of the things we're talking about right now in global health is how do we be better prepared for when the next disease threat comes around? And I think one thing we all have to learn is it's not about reinventing the wheel. It's about understanding how the current platforms in global health can be utilized to identify and respond to a new disease threat. Um, and, and ultimately, I hope that realization helps lead us, lead us towards investments in global health that are much more systems oriented and that ultimately are pointing towards, yes, ending AIDS, TB, and malaria. And as we do that, using that as an opportunity to build towards universal health coverage. Thank you, Chris. Um, now, for, for uh, those of uh, you who are accessing this podcast by video, you will see that I've been checking my phone on and off uh, during the course, and I imagine that's going to continue during this podcast. Not something we do usually, but I'm delighted to say that Chin Wei is back with us. Now, Chin Wei, could I get you to just finish that comment about how HIV impacted your thinking in Nigeria? So internally, um, like I said, our medical team and established care um, ed educators were they, they were able to share public health messages about COVID-19 and the vaccines. And they were really well placed to do this because they are and they're trusted members of the community. And um, they also understood that the, the challenges their peers um were experiencing and how to effectively communicate this to them. And this was very helpful when we were faced with the onslaught of misinformation and disinformation that we experienced. But from a partnership perspective, um, we, we at Chevron Nigeria became co-chair of the Oil and Gas Industry Initiative for COVID-19. Um, this initiative is a consortium of international and indigenous oil companies with operations in Nigeria who had a similar in interest in responding to COVID-19 and helping the country to have a good response. So we were able to work with familiar partners, partners that we had worked on with the HIV response in the past. This initiative was able to support the national healthcare delivery facilities in over in our 36 states of the federation in three key areas. The first one was we provided medical consumables and diagnostics such as face masks, COVID-19 diagnostic test kits. Secondly, we were able to provide ambulances, buses, ventilators, hospital beds, and logistics for running inpatient support systems. This was much needed on the ground and definitely appreciated. And then lastly, we supported the construction of medical facilities, including intensive care facilities, overflow hospitals, temporary isolation medical centers, as well as a as permanent medical infrastructure that could be used during and post the pandemic. Um, some of these structures were like the labs. We had to build a diagnostic PCR lab for one of the states because they had nothing to um, test. And then another one was a, a, a state that really needed um, something as simple as accommodation for the doctors who were responding. And the hospital in question was the hub where that state was using to mount the response. So I think as a, a company, um, we stood up both internally to help um, the company respond, 
within our workforce. And like Dr. Abassi said, um, also in our communities of operation. This is something that we've been um, doing in the past um, with HIV, malaria, TB, and definitely we did that again with COVID-19. So I'd like to stay in Nigeria, if I may, for a moment, because as well as the um, internal workplace programs and partnerships that I guess, whether you're a multinational company or a multinational NGO, Sally, you would have had to cover. But that didn't stop you from working on, on other key health issues. And I'd really love to pause a bit and just talk a bit about malaria, which <clears throat> is one of those co-travelers with AIDS and TB that one of the three infectious diseases through the Global Fund we're all committed to, to addressing. And um, a key component of that work is rolling out the implementation of a new vaccine and for malaria. And, and Sally, I wonder if you could talk a bit about what you are doing there and how you're working with Chevron in Nigeria to, to help roll out that implementation. Thank you, Ben. Um, these are pretty exciting times for the RTSS malaria vaccine. Uh, PATH has been involved in this work for some 20 years, and I just want to acknowledge that it, it really is all about partnerships, partnerships with GSK, with African research centers, with communities to bring the vaccine thus far. And the vaccine is actually already in a large scale pilot implementation in Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi that has been coordinated by WHO which means that since 2019, about 1 million children across the three countries have actually received uh, the vaccine thus far. And in October of last year, WHO recommended widespread use of the vaccine for young children living in areas of moderate to high malaria transmission. And this paved the way for Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, to approve financing of a malaria vaccination program. And in turn, this means that other countries with children at risk of malaria, including high burden countries like Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of the Congo and many others will have an opportunity to apply for vaccine introduction and supply grants through Gavi if they're eligible. But first, countries need to decide if this vaccine is appropriate for them. This is a complex process as the vaccine needs to be integrated not only into their immunization programs, but also into their uh, malaria control programs. And these may need to work together in ways that may be new to them. Countries need to understand their burden of malaria, where it is most severe, and where and how a new malaria control tool, like a vaccine, could be added to the suite of currently used tools like bed nets and indoor residual spraying. Also, due to anticipated supply constraints, not unusual in the new vaccine introduction world, countries will need to determine where the vaccine could be used subnationally for greatest impact. Where are those children at the greatest risk of contracting malaria? Where are the children at greatest risk of dying before their fifth birthdays? And I say all this because it's important to kind of position and understand the work that we've begun thanks to our partnership with Chevron in Nigeria. And our goal there is to support the efforts of the Federal Ministry of Health, and in this case, the National Malaria Elimination Program and the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, to work together on their decision-making process. And if that decision is positive on a roadmap to phased introduction of the vaccine, and the two elements that we're focused on right now are really about understanding what are some of the key factors that influence malaria vaccine demand and new vaccine introduction decisions and priorities. And so we're working with Chevron to develop a survey that will be done with key stakeholders at the federal and state levels, as well as with key stakeholders from pri private sector, civil society, and all, and all of that. And then as a second step, we are hoping that this survey will really inform the development of a malaria vaccine introduction roadmap for Nigeria. Again, what we envision and hope that the Nigerian government will lead is a consultative process which really engages communities and, and stakeholders at all levels. And it might be worth noting that PATH has supported similar processes in the three pilot countries in Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi, as well as similar efforts around other vaccines in other countries. 
And our goal in all of this, and I think we've heard this quite a bit during this conversation with respect to COVID-19, it's all about evidence-based decision-making. We want to ensure that countries make decisions based upon the best available evidence. We want to be a good partner in that. And thanks to this kind of experience, we understand the importance of a diverse group of stakeholders being involved in the process, including the private corporate sector, because they have a really massive stake in the health of the communities in which they work. And I hope this gives you a sense a little bit of the work that we do and how important our partnership with Chevron is. And I know we'll, I hope we'll come back to talk a little bit more about some of the work that we are doing and how we've responded on the COVID-19 front. But flexibility, partnership, all of this are just incredibly important as we move through the work, especially in a country like Nigeria. Well, Sally, thanks for that. Uh, and I think you've really set us up for the next part of the conversation, which is look to the future and where do we go from here? And if it's okay, Huma, I'd like to kick this part off with a short video that you all produced with your operating company in Kazakhstan, um, which looks at both the health impacts directly of COVID, but also the mental health impact that during this period of lockdown uh, potentially affected uh, employees in the company. And I think it's important for two reasons. Firstly, because it absolutely shows the hand and influence of Chevron's Health and Medical, you and your colleagues. But I think it's also important because it shows that in a period when there was so much happening and so much uncertainty, companies, their health and medical departments and their human resource departments have been on the front line providing advice and counsel. Hello from Tingiz, Kazakhstan. I am Greg Gable, the TCO Production Operations Manager. Over these last 18 months, just like you and the rest of the world, our TCO team has gone through major changes in how we work, from some very long rotations of our essential personnel here in Tingiz to many others having to adapt to working remotely. We all pulled together to ensure continued, safe, reliable production from our existing base business facilities and we continue to progress critical work activities on our future growth project. During this time in 2020, at the height of the pandemic and during the transformation, TCO leaders recognized the risk of ill health to our workforce and to our business performance. So we requested mental health support. Our HR team partnered with Health and Medical and EAP to develop and implement a 16-week well-being program to support extended rotations, isolation, physical and psychological fatigue. The program provided mental health and resilience tips, tools, resources, including resources for our quarantined workers so they could understand how to try to be healthy during their isolation. Emotional and mental health well-being were addressed in a comprehensive campaign that targeted kind of the dual challenge of our global pandemic and the economic uncertainties faced by everyone. We maximized the reach of our messages by utilizing all the channels and leveraging local resources here to develop an integrated communication plan. The goal was to engage the workforce to focus on their health in these stressful times so that we could meet our business demands. Leadership endorsement and sponsorship of such programs recognize the value of health and demonstrate TCO's continuing commitment to the health, safety, and well-being of our workforce. Thank you. So, there we are. And I guess, Huma, if I could kick off with you, um, I think if I may ask a very direct question, I, I'm seeing this from the outside, that health and medical is becoming much more of a central business critical function in international companies. And I think this is an example of that. You have stepped in to support not only a COVID response, but helping the company understand the impact of the challenges on mental health. Uh, would I be right in thinking that? Have you seen changes in your role? 
Absolutely, uh, Ben. Um, when I when I go back two years, I uh, remember when we started this uh, response to COVID. And I think, you know, the greatest thing for me is that we were not starting from scratch. We had a foundation, a good um, infrastructure to start from. Uh, responding to incidents and outbreaks is nothing new for us. So we were actually leveraging from our lessons learned from the past, from the HIV journey, from HIV AIDS, tuber- tuberculosis and malaria partnerships to help us guide the way in providing a good, solid, robust response centrally um, in terms of COVID-19. We uh, used our decades of work to educate, communicate, working with partners, building capacity within our clinical teams and managing uh, procurements as, uh, you know, the work that we did was invaluable and taught us how we can provide a good response to COVID-19. We used our uh, stream- streamlined programming that we had for over 60 years on malaria to uh, make sure that we had guidance documents, we had workplace procedure, which we, you saw that TCO was using to provide them guidance on um how to move forward with the frontline workers. Because one of the things I think that's unique to our industry and our business is that we had some of our people never um, sat at home and they were working on the front lines every day of, um, you know, this, uh, this COVID where we did not have preventive tools, we did not have vaccines. So we had to learn from our response from the prior uh, public health diseases and make sure that we, um, you know, uh, let them go to work safely. What we learned that strengthening of collaboration within the department at a regional, local, and uh, global level was very, very important. We saw strengthening of partnerships with other disciplines in Chevron. And I think I've mentioned that, that how we work with human resources and uh, procurement and supply chain and emergency management and safety officers to make sure that we had a comprehensive response. Our technology enhancements in terms of uh, you know, digital fluency, uh, power apps, dashboards, EMR or electronic medical record improvements were the key in making sure that we had those virtual solutions where, um, when people needed access to medical care and especially to uh, mental health. And then um, I think that one of the things that I saw was the heightened trust in health and medical as an SME. Um, I don't think in the last uh, couple of years, anyone has questioned why do I have a big budget and why um, I have a big team supporting me. And I think that uh, that was the key and people realize how important is, it is to have uh, these resources internally and how important it's, it's to have a partnership and these mature partnerships to rely on when you need help. I think that's really helpful, um, Huma, and I'm hoping that um, uh, the uh, leaders of corporations understand the need for health and medical departments to have appropriate large budgets. So absolutely. Um, Eric, could I turn to you? You and I have been speaking about the kind of maturing of corporate partnerships. We're seeing some of the external partners happening here, but there's something about seeing um uh, uh energy company employees in central asia in kazakhstan wearing masks that i feel sends a really important message what are your thoughts well i i want to um validate the um and applaud the willingness of a corporate entity to um realize their responsibility uh, that they already hold to their employees, the families, and the community around their workspaces. Uh, Chevron, from as early as I can remember, back in the early 80s, um, uh, Chevron was present uh, at the outbreak in San Francisco, uh, in setting up the AIDS clinic at San Francisco General in uh, 81, 82, and the inpatient service in those same years uh, Chevron, because of its appreciation on a personal level with senior leadership in the program, having personal experiences with employees and family members who contracted HIV, they were present from day one in supporting both the outpatient clinic and the inpatient clinic on a one clinic and one hospital uh, at a time basis, which uh, I will always be grateful for. 
it bridged us before 10 years of no federal dollars coming for treatment or diagnosis to HIV infected people in the United States. That type of partnership created the service portfolio that became the so-called San Francisco model, which used community uh, empowerment for both planning and service implementation, really for the first time in our communities, uh, and made a huge imprint on how HIV and now other diseases are cared for. Uh, it fed and and uh, became the data argument for uh, the Ryan White Care Act, which is a PEPFAR equivalent for domestic uh, HIV, indigent HIV uh, infected individuals in the United States. But I think, so I applaud that, understand it, and have been immersed in it for most of my career. Um, we still need it. It needs to increase. So all of what's been said, uh, I completely agree with. But we have to pause and look at where we're going with this methodologic approach to responding to unmet need in distant sites. Uh, I think uh, early in that partnership, uh, and again, it's needed and it is um, something that um, companies uh, choose to either ignore or engage with. The engagement is the appropriate response and crescendoing with that but at the same time, if you are not working to align the uh, accountability in the system to, to be reflected to those who are responsible for the population, government, third party payers, private sector, insurance, civil society, it's a lot of stakeholders make up who's responsible for that response. But I think if we aren't working towards it, we are not... Um, uh, positioning the needs met and unmet in a uh, process that fills them. Uh, and I think we have, after 50 plus years of a parachute type approach to response, still needed, don't misunderstand me, but what we need to work on are linear uh, directed investments in moving that shift of responsibility away from entities that are thousands of miles away from the population and never really accountable in feedback loops or in taking a responsibility for the outcomes generated in year one, feeding into the year two budget and changing them. The dialogue with those who use and depend on the services is minimal. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, populations don't often even know what's expected of them when there's an aggressive attempt to pull them in, population who use the services, into planning and implementing these programs. But it is where we need to go. As Chris was saying, the, uni the movement toward universal health coverage is, um, I think, ethically uh, what the patients that we've already assumed responsibility for in HIV, TB, and malaria with uh, kind of multilateral external donor-driven services, those um, needs uh, now need to be realigned with the entities that are responsible for those populations. And we, as, as donor grantee support to these efforts, need to facilitate that alignment. Uh, and I think COVID showed us that in spades. Uh, it showed us also, which has been said nicely in this discussion, that to not use already up and running platforms that are well interfaced with populations is unethical. And to uh, jump over a PEPFAR type platform with 200, 300 service sites in one country uh, and not use the doctors, nurses, healthcare workers, procurement distribution systems and laboratories on the front end of that response um, is indefensible. And I think the United States fell far short of the response it could have mounted had it just pivoted into allowing that platform to be used. It serves as a example of where we need to go. Uh, I applaud everyone scrambling to try to respond to unmet needs. Uh, this is not criticism. I'm just saying, as Ben was alluding to, are we not mature enough now to look at what the end game must look like? And can we not align our current investments better to achieve that? 
Yeah, thanks, Eric. And I, I, that last question, I'd actually like to put, if it's okay, briefly, because I know we're getting up to the top of the hour, to you, Sally. Um, you know, how do we do this more consistently and effectively and sustainably? Um, now, you're looking at it as a large nonprofit with a range of services that you have yourself. And I just wonder if the experience that you've had in managing COVID could be brought to bear in these broader conversations about sustainability. That's a very interesting question. Um, wow. I think, I think a point that's been made kind of directly or indirectly is that it's really important that organizations prioritize the health and well-being of their staff. You know, we all know the saying, you, you can't take uh, care of others if you don't take care of yourself. So I think that um, sustainability of the work that we do is really about also ensuring from the get-go that we are actually looking inside our own house and making sure that we do, um, do the best thing for our own staff. Um, sustainability in terms of what we've learned from COVID-19, I think one of the things that's going to be very interesting moving forward is how we make efficient use of resources. I think that one of the things we've really learned from COVID-19 is that we don't necessarily need to get on a plane at the drop of a hat. And that means that we are able to make scarce resources go further. And I think that's going to be incredibly important given some of some of the challenges that we're seeing at global levels about how to do the work. Um, I think the other issue that was raised a little while ago is this idea that somehow COVID-19 is actually over. It's not. It's ongoing. And there was a comment made also earlier about this need to recover lost ground we have to be looking when we think about sustainability as to how we also bring people back to get the health services that they may have not gone out for. And here I'm thinking, for example, of antenatal care um, or child health, well health, you know, well health visits that aren't linked, for example, to getting a particular vaccine or something else, but the more routine care that many countries are actually trying to expand uh, the use of. So, um, and of course, we have to be looking at what further threats may actually um, emerge. I could go further, but um, I would uh, love maybe just... Um, we could talk also a little bit about um, some of the ways that we've had to respond to COVID-19 in terms of the work that we do. I don't know if that's of interest. I realize we're running out of time and I just want to be respectful of other people as well. Well, you know what? I think, Sally, we have another podcast uh, in the making here. And so uh, I, I would love to come back to you. And I also think there are some things from both the Chevron side, from the community health center side and friends um, and the academic side that we should, it would be really helpful to, to do. But perhaps to sort of wrap this conversation up, a general question for all of you about what you see happening from here, both in terms of your partnerships with uh, large organizations like Chevron, uh, but also what it means for you in terms of your own work. But let me start then with you, Lance. Has COVID changed the way everything works? Will we ever be able to go back to how things were before? Oh, um, uh, no, I, I think we can't. I think that's the responsibility that we have is we have to learn from what we just experienced and, and continue to experience, how, we, how we've all been talking about, how nimble and agile, how we need to pivot on a dime when, when we're encountering these um, pandemics, these crises, you know, and I hope that, you know, we're learning how here in San Francisco, we, we figure this out with our homelessness crisis, which is linked to the opioid overdose and all the deaths that we're experiencing with that and, and, and the mental illness here in our city. And so, and then how we engage community. I feel like what we really did in this moment was, was really engage community in a way that was meaningful, that we valued lived experience, that that 
was 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 hugely centered how our response was centered around um, engagement of community and maybe one last thing is just how how we can't just be insular we do have to reach out we do have to connect with what's going on uh, uh, beyond where we're serving because there's so many lessons to be learned from here globally but what we did of course was reach out to partners um, providing HIV services in communities of color and continue to connect and learn and support each other through this work. Um, and so, so we have to continue doing that. Chris, same question for you. And if I may give you an opportunity to um, give a plug to a report that you've recently released, which I think involved uh, a good number of us on this call around how to engage the tech sector. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think COVID has potentially changed a whole lot of things in global health. And I think it's up to us to seize that opportunity and not just fall back on where we were, but take this as a learning moment. And, you know, I think one of the things in global health is people have realized out of this that it takes a system. Uh, it takes the partnerships we've all been talking about, but it, it takes well-funded health systems that can respond to needs of people today and identify and respond to new threats when they emerge. So again, I think the experience of COVID could be an impetus to thinking about um, in our programs that have been disease focused, how do we keep all the ambition and all the strong elements of those programs while thinking much more horizontally and much more um, intentionally about system strengthening for the future. I think that's the future of pandemic preparedness and the opportunity there. Um, yes, also in terms of the future, one of the big opportunities is the digital revolution and what that can do for health in terms of getting health information to people, linking them to services, um, having consumers monitor their own, uh, the quality of their own health care, um, helping with surveillance. Um, and also just making health much more personal um, and at your fingertips. So I think there's huge opportunities for digital health. And we were really happy to partner with Chevron and the Bay Area Global Health Alliance and others in January to do uh, a web-based discussion about the promise of digital health. Uh, and we came out with a report that uh, we did with Chevron support um, with some key recommendations about, about how to move forward here. I mean, one of the things is we need to make sure the digital revolution advances global health equity rather than taking us back the other way and creating more inequality. So I think we need to be quite thoughtful right now about how to do that, that understanding that many people don't have access actually to the internet now or to digital capacity. So part of it's an access issue. Part of it's a literacy issue. And this is one thing I really appreciated uh, Janice David, Davis uh, Street in, in her review of our report really emphasized the need to do more around digital literacy, but also making sure the digital tools are people-centered, that they're respecting confidentiality, they don't put anybody at risk, um, or release information about individuals that, that they don't want out. So there's a whole list of things we need to do to um, harness the opportunity of, of digital health. And I think that's, um, that's right in front of us too. And these all tie together, right? This understanding that right. we need to be thinking about systems, this understanding that we could uh, really use digital tools much more effectively in health. Let's bring that together and use digital tools to strengthen health systems, engagement of people in their own health care, engagement of communities, monitoring of quality, and uh, identifying uh, where improvement is needed. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Chinwei, I don't know if you can hear me and see me, but I'm going to come to you now. Very briefly, where do we go from here? What has COVID taught us, particularly for you working in Nigeria? Well, in responding to that, I'll just say, first of all, thankfully, we were able to respond in a meaningful way to the pandemic. But having said that, I do um, realize that we have to have a more coordinated response. We have to go back and look inside and say what's on ground in terms of the primary health structures, in terms of health system strengthening. What can we do to coordinate that response and advocate for a better response? I, I kind of think that the next pandemic, can we be more prepared? Definitely. And that's a conversation that um, 
we do need to have both with the um, country and the other NGOs who are working on it, and also our public health authorities. We do have our public health authorities. So I, I think the next thing would really be to um, sit down and say, are we out of the woods? Not yet. But um, what can we do to be better prepared for the um, next um, outbreak? Thanks for that. Now, I, I sense that if we were doing this in person, uh, the conference organisers would probably be kicking us out of the <laughs> satellite symposium room at the moment. Um, so I think we now look to to wrap up this part of the pod or this this podcast. There's so much more to discuss, um, and I think Huma, there uh, is the uh, there's a conversation you and I should have afterwards about whether you Jinwei and I can have a further conversation recorded about. The kind of things that that Chevron has learned directly about uh, of coming out of this period, but as we wrap up, Huma, any final thoughts uh, and reflections that you've had? Well, thank you, Ben. And firstly, I would like to thank you and the rest of my esteemed panel member for being here. Um, I am, you know, anytime I hear from experts like these from various diverse fields of public health, I am enlightened. I learn a lot. So I want to. Thank you for being here today and also for throughout uh, the last few years for your partnerships all along that made Chevron uh, be successful in some of our health programs. The other thing, um, you know, I, I will say here is that these relationships and examples show us what is the value in these cross organizational and cross working across sectors in various areas of public health. Uh, we have already learned, I think, in the last few years how interconnected we are as a species and as a society. And I think that also highlights the fact that we need to focus our attention on collaboration, on our collective experiences, and uh, learn from those experiences uh, and uh, think about the delivery. The other thing I will say, though, is that, you know, we are stronger than ever. I would like to leave this with a positive thought and we will continue to build our HIV response. As a matter of fact, other uh, pandemic response, we continue to learn, but we uh, will take up the challenge and um, try to support in the best way we can, um, you know, to uh, provide support to these organizations, but also others that we have worked with in the past um, towards our effort to um, equitable health systems. Well, thank you, Huma. And, and thank you to everybody on this panel today. It's been wide ranging uh, and it's been really interesting. Uh, a, a bit of a wild ride, hey, for all of us. So let me thank our panel for a fascinating conversation. Thanks to Sally Ethelson, to Chris Collins, to Eric Goosby, Lance Tomer, Chinwe Okala, and of course, Huma Abassi. Thanks also to Chevron's Janice Davis Street and Mike Steinberg for all their assistance. And of course, thanks goes to Eric Espera from Newsdoc Media, our director and our technical whiz. Now, if you are live in Montreal with us, we may have a little time left for a few questions. I'll let my future self, God willing, speak to that. If you are listening or watching us through your favorite podcast platform, you can reach us in the comments section or you can email us directly at a shot in the arm podcast at gmail.com with any questions or comments. Hope you found this podcast useful. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you download your podcasts and give us five stars. And don't forget to stay hydrated and have a great week, everyone. <laughs>